Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the latest iteration of BSLM's webinar series. The subject for this evening is Long COVID Recovering and Wellbeing. And our presenters this evening are Susie Bolt and Dr. Deepak Ravindran. There are over 250 people attending this evening, so it's a subject that's really chiming forward with people at the moment. Let me introduce our speakers. Susie has worked in the wellbeing industry for over 25 years. She combines over two decades of yoga teaching with NLP coaching, group training, and person-centered counseling skills to create a gentle mind-body approach to health, well-being, and recovery. 360 Mind Body Soul was set up by Susie in early March 2020, but by the end of March, COVID struck and Susie became more and more unwell, taking around 12 months for a full recovery. Based on her experiences, she realized many people could be helped by learning about the power of regulating the autonomic nervous system using simple techniques. In September 22, uh, 2022, Susie created an online program called Rest, Repair, Recover, which is now recommended by NH trusts, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, pain management consultants, occupational therapists, and long COVID clinics, not only in the UK, but across the world. Deepak is a BSLM diplomate and full-time NHS consultant in pain, MSK, lifestyle medicine, and is clinical lead for the pain medicine and long COVID service at the Royal Berkshire NHS Foundation Trust. And he's also the author of the Amazon bestseller, Pain-Free Mindset. He has a trauma-informed upstreamist approach to pain practice and has helped set up the community pain service in Berkshire in, 20, in 2015 and the Berkshire Long COVID Integrated Service in 2020. If that's not enough, he's recently completed a management honours degree at Henley Bar uh, Business School and has been awarded the National Apprentice of the Year for 2021 by the Chartered Management Institute. He's part of the Scientific Advisory Board at Curable, My Pain, and also part of the Footsteps, Footsteps Festival team. He's also an advisor to UK's first online pain clinic, the Lever Clinic. So welcome and thank you very much to Susie and Deepra, Deepak. This proves, uh, should be a fantastic session and I'll hand over to you, uh, wasting no more time. Let's get started. Good evening and welcome to this BSLM webinar on long COVID with me Deepak Ravindran and Susie Bold from 360 Mind Body Soul. For the next hour we'll be talking all things long COVID and I'm going to kick off with a short presentation and introduction to our present understanding of long COVID. As some of you may be aware, I'm the clinical lead for the Berkshire Long COVID Service, which is one of the 90 such clinics in England that have been set up way back in November 2020. Our clinic was certainly the first one that came through at that time in Berkshire, and we have seen over 1,600 patients at this point of time at this presentation. So what do we know about Long COVID? This is something to be very clear about that we are dealing with a multi-system problem. We know that acute COVID is also a multi-system condition, not just a respiratory problem. And long COVID similarly has got multiple symptoms. There is no association with the severity of the initial condition. And what we actually are in this unique situation where we don't fully understand the natural history and the prognosis therefore is difficult to define. A lot of the information has actually been gained from the collaboration and the co-production with patient groups and really a good understanding of what patients are actually going through, whether it's Zoe's study or whether it's the 360 Mind Body Soul Facebook group or whether it's Body Politic or the Long COVID SOS. It's been the power of the patient view that has shaped how our understanding and in fact the naming of this condition is. The problem is quite significant that the Office of National Statistics has confirmed just last month that 3.1% of the UK population, which is almost more than 2 million people, have uh, been left with uh, this problem and it has been almost 
uh, affecting the day-to-day -day activities of 1.4 million, with the most common symptoms reported in the study being fatigue, breathlessness, cough, and aches and pains. What must be remembered is that the Office of National Statistics does not take into account people in university halls, in secure institutions, in care homes and nursing homes. And actually, if you start including those numbers, then I think we probably are looking at a much bigger percentage of a productive workforce probably being off work and not contributing to the economy to the extent that actually the Financial Times talks about labor shortages and a public health crisis that's come through. Now, the symptoms of long COVID, as you understand it now, in fact, this particular diagram kind of illustrates the number of symptoms that come from different organ systems. In my clinical practice, I can tell you that definitely lots of patients are struggling with lots of symptoms from many different organs. <coughs> In fact, there's one study that came out last year, which suggested that almost 200 symptoms are coming from almost 10 organ systems. So it is a significant impact on a patient. But the main things that often come to our clinic here are the fatigue, the pain, the shortness of breath, GI symptoms, cardiac symptoms, dysautonomia with palpitation and POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia, brain fog, headache, migraine being worse, new onset mental health issues, and finally loss of taste and smell. All of these have been quite heavily reported and more commonly reported. The diagnosis is still very much a patient-led view in the sense that we are going to say that COVID may or may not have occurred, so they don't need to have a positive diagnostic test. The symptoms themselves can be very gradual and onset following the initial illness. We are in fact getting patients who have long COVID-like symptoms starting after the vaccine themselves with no evidence of positive COVID tests at all. And actually three months has been the arbitrary figure that the NICE guidelines have kept. Although long COVID in their own guidelines is anything after four weeks, which is the combination of ongoing symptomatic COVID and beyond 12 weeks, the post-COVID syndrome, both these groups are combined together to call as long COVID. What we right now don't have is a single satisfactory or one single blood test to indicate whether they have got COVID or not. So essentially blood tests are often done as a way of ruling out any obvious other organ dysfunction or abnormality. The causes right now, for all practical purposes, the virus causes a significant impact on on the nervous and the immune system. Hey everybody, it's uh, just in... system hyperactivity, oh, especially we're one due to pause briefly. The mast cells, which release histamine, are suspected. Thanks. Uh, it's just been brought to my attention the chat function isn't working at the moment, so we're working on that to get that up and running again. If there are any questions, use the Q and A function. Uh, obviously, just next to the chat function, but we'll get that up and running as soon as we can. So sorry for the uh, inconvenience and hopefully we get that sorted quite soon. Okay, Max, if we'd go again, thanks. Expected to be at a problem. The other combination is the nervous system dysfunction. And again, within it, the autonomic nervous system dysfunction is supposed to be a very common presentation. There is a lot of research looking into the combination of microthrombi or a vascular cause causing sticky blood which is being looked at and researched now. And lastly, there's always the thought that is this just a residual effect on the immune system or could there be some viral fragments that is reactivating the immune system every time there is exposure. And actually the risk of getting long COVID has also been looked at now and the study suggests that if you're having uh, women between the ages of 35 to 70 with pre-existing poor mental health or history of diabetes, asthma, or multiple number of symptoms at initial presentation, then they are likely to be at risk of long COVID. And as such, that means that people who are living in sort of deprived areas or key workers or associated comorbidities seem to be the highest prevalence. Treatments wise, right now where we are is we have to understand that this is a long term condition. At this point of time, there is no cure or quick fix for it. While research is very active, 
we still are only able to manage this symptomatically. There are many options of treatments and interventions and drugs that are being talked about in the social media and among patient groups. But the reality is that in England, with the NICE guidelines in place right now, we do not have any other recognized drugs or treatments that are expected to do very well. Obviously, in the long COVID service that we are part of, we've realized and we've been trying to provide a service that has been recognized with many awards within the organization and in the local area and covered in the media. And our understanding itself is that there are physical, there are cognitive, there are mental symptoms with the physical and the cognitive symptoms being the most common symptoms. And the research as well has really grown and leaps and bounds with more than $1.3 billion of research promised in the US, looking into various aspects of the condition and in the UK, almost 30 to 35 million with a variety of research projects as outlined here. Ultimately, I tend to look on this as a framework that I've developed in terms of understanding how you want to treat and manage long COVID. So there may certainly be the role for medication. So there might be a role for antihistamines. There may be a role for heart rate control drugs. There may be a role for managing other aspects of pain or fatigue or mood and mental health. That's a possibility. But there are interventions which are being looked at. I was part of a virtual reality conference to look and see how we can retrain respiratory patterns or breathing dysfunction or heart rate dysfunction using these platforms. So that may be an option to consider. Certainly there is a lot of interest in looking at an anti-inflammatory diet and to see whether we can use and calm the immune system down through nutrition. And you'll see the parallels here with the six pillars of lifestyle medicine coming through with the focus on sleep and its optimization with the focus on various mind body therapies and using peer support and using groups to manage the patients there and to think about a variety of mind body techniques like yoga like tai chi and other relaxation strategies ultimately pacing planning and prioritizing and using that for fatigue and brain fog management is becoming a very fast reality in most long covid clinics whether you achieve sleep optimization through wearables or trackers or various apps and the use of digital technology is really coming up by leaps and bounds so ultimately what i would like to leave you with is that we are dealing with a new long-term condition which is affecting a significant number of people. And that means that we've got to have an opportunity here to actually create an integrated service that takes into account the lifestyle medicine principles to give the best benefit for patients at this time. Thank you for listening to me and I'll hand over to Susie for her presentation. See you later at the Q&A. Hi, my name is Susie Bolt. I I have been a yoga teacher for around 25 years. I'm an NLP master practitioner, a coach. Um, I have counseling training. I'm a trained group facilitator and trainer and a psychometrics coach. And in March, 2020, like many other early adopters, I caught COVID and became more and more unwell until around the very end of May, early June, my GP sent me an ambulance to take me into hospital to find out what was going on. Like many people, I was given the all clear, which was great on one hand. <laughs> but on the other, I'd never been so ill in my life. I had symptoms like tachycardia, extreme lung pain, bleeding joints, particularly around my finger joints, uh, brain fog, word loss, hair loss, fatigue, GI issues, shortness of breath, a tremor, stammer, noise sensitivity, skin rashes, and so it went on. So I came home and realized that I was on my own and that actually feeling like I was on my own wasn't a very productive place to be. So I set up a Facebook group that was focused on recovery. There was quite a lot of social media activity around symptoms and fear and death at that point in 2020, but there wasn't anything very specifically focused on recovery. So I decided that I would set that up for myself and just see who wanted to join. And I posted short videos of relaxation, calming work, 
because I realized the autonomic nervous system was playing a role in what was potentially happening in my body. I'm just going to share my screen. So I set up a company at the beginning of lockdown uh, to host my yoga classes online. Quite quickly, I needed to get other people to teach for me uh, as my illness became more and more extreme. And then at some point I wasn't teaching at all, but I realized quite early on that I would be able to teach classes that would be suitable for people like myself. So we set up the Rest Repair Recover program, which helps people get the basics right. So we talk about medical testing, screening and diagnostics, what appropriate medication might be out there that people have tried. Uh, how to get sleep when the autonomic nervous system is not letting you get more than 45 minutes. We encourage people to think about nutrition and gut health. We provide a great amount of education via interviews, which I'll show you in a moment. We talk about the importance of stress management as well as movement and exercise, but to work there with a real understanding that you cannot approach exercise in the way that you did before. And then we also talk about what else helps us heal because really we need to create the ideal environment for the body to do what it does best. Um, and when you've got a chronic set of experiences going on and maybe you've lost your identity, your relationships have changed, you haven't been able to work for quite a long time, sick pay is being challenged now, some people have lost their homes, it is very difficult to create the right environment internally for you to be able to recover. And so to create a group, a community of people to support each other was really important because joy, laughter, gratitude, love, compassion, empathy, belief and support are fundamentally important to help people move into a healing state. So the Rest Repair Recover program was born in September 2020. It started out with just a couple of classes that myself and my colleague Ross co-taught. He was also someone who'd been recovering from longer COVID. Um, and it has grown and grown. There are now about 11 or 12 classes ranging from breathing, respiratory rehab classes to mindfulness, to yoga for menopause, to yoga for deep sleep. All of the focus is on calming the nervous system, allowing that vagus nerve to retone and to help people feel understood and connected with others on a similar journey. So we offer daily activity with live classes, which can be accessed later. So we have people from all over the world. You don't just have to be in the UK. Uh, we have a group support and a hive mind chat every week, which will have between 50 and 80 people attend live and lots of people watch it on catch up. We have sessions which are specifically designed to help you train the autonomic nervous system that you can even attend from bed. And I think that's really important that people know that just because they're bed bound, there are still things that they can do. It is not exercise, it is autonomic retraining. And then we have a Facebook group, which now has thousands and thousands of people in it, which offers support 24 seven for questions and information, which is a really important resource because when you're not well and something goes on in the middle of the night that's new, it's a really amazing feature to be able to just type in the search bar at the top of the group you know, a particular symptom and, oh, look, there's 23 chats on that already. It's really normalizing, which is important. Early on, consultant cardiologist had been hearing about my work through his patients, and he's been an amazing support and collaborator with me ever since, um, and has helped us learn about POTS, about MCAS, and most importantly, about dysautonomia, because that's his specialist subject. And the route out for a lot of these, particularly the dysautonomia piece, is around working with the nervous system to help calm it down and regulate so that the body comes out of that chronic sympathetic overdrive and you can activate the parasympathetic. This uh, interview with Boone led me to many more interviews. So Josh Dunst, the founder of the Stasis Breathing Program, which was put together with the funding from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. They've been big leaders in the kind of recovery program 
and the ideas for it um, since since March 2020, really. And um, Stasis was free for at least 18 months and is now paid. But getting people to understand the importance and the power of working with your breath and the impact that it has on the whole of your nervous system and your immune system, I think has been a huge piece that's quite difficult to sell to people. But so many people have gone through the stasis breathing program now and realized that it has made a massive difference to their symptoms, that they're more on board than they have been uh, to this point. So, so that is definitely good and progress. Um, obviously, I've talked to Deepak, which is how we've met and helping people understand the role of pain and the role of pain and inflammation in the body as a response to the COVID infection and what can be done about it. Um, and I host all of those on my YouTube channel. So people don't have to pay to do our program. They can work through quite a few of the classes that we have posted on the channel. They can watch the interviews. And um, the only thing they can't take part in is group chat. But the program itself is only eight pounds a week. I wanted to price it around the same price as a prescription here in the UK. And for that, they get all of the classes, access to all of the recordings, um, and they can attend any of it live that works for them timing wise. Um, but I would say the key piece has been to create a space where people are understood, validated, given the opportunity to share some of the really difficult emotions that people have from shame and guilt to despair. Um, but then also the hive mind because we have a lot of people who stick around because they absolutely love the community and they're there as my kind of group elders to offer support, encouragement, tips, advice and it's a phenomenally powerful experience and one that I'm incredibly proud of um, and it has filled a space that was very very empty I've realized um, and I think a lot of people find the work that we do really, really transformative. As you can see here, the Rest Repair Recover program has been an absolute lifesaver for me. I have found a community that understand what I'm going through and offer support and inspiration to help me not give up hope. Because when you're stuck at home alone with a chronic illness and so much of your life has been stripped away, it is very hard to not give up hope. So um, if you can encourage people to just keep going, maybe to learn about dysautonomia, to learn about the, the power of just working with their breath, there are no silver bullets for this. That would be an amazing gift to give any of your patients. Okay, so welcome to part three of our presentation that we've stitched together. And this part, Deepak and I are going to be exploring some questions that I have gathered from my Facebook group, which is full of people who've got long COVID and are on their recovery journey. And there are actually hundreds of questions that we could be exploring, but today we are going to start with one of the things that feels really, really relevant right now. And it is this current new variant, which is obviously uh, doing the rounds in quite an impressive way. I, I'm sitting here uh, still testing positive with it myself. Um, and I think a lot of people are just wanting to know, okay, so um, what's, the, what's the kind of data on hospital admissions? Are people getting really sick? Are the vaccines preventing, you know, um, quite severe illness? Or is that just now the variant itself becoming just a softer version of the original that came in two years ago. So your thoughts on that would be really welcome. Um, a really good question, Susie. And I think uh, it's very topical in everyone's mind because this variant, I think the BA.5 variant as it is officially called, is supposedly, again, quite infectious. So that is why there's such a huge prevalence and everyone I know is getting it. You know, my son's just recovering from it. Um, but what is at least on one side good to see is that we've not had any rise in the ICU admissions in my hospital. So I'm going to probably take it from the professor of my hospital, which is 
one of the sort of the second biggest or one of the biggest district general hospitals in the UK. So it's a fairly huge population size we serve. And our ICU numbers, there's just been one ICU admission the last six weeks, and it hasn't really gone up anymore. The hospital admissions, yes, have gone up. They have definitely increased considerably in the last few weeks. But the good thing that I hear from my other colleagues is that most of the time, these are patients who have other comorbidities. So people are still being admitted with COVID and other conditions getting worse alongside COVID rather than COVID themselves causing a pneumonia or a severe chest infection like we saw with the first two waves. Yeah. I think I would still consider that vaccination is going to be very effective in preventing a severe infection, but in preventing long COVID or probably preventing even having COVID of any kind, mild or moderate, that doesn't seem to be influenced by vaccination at all. You know, all of us are vaccinated and boosted, but this variant seems to be finding its way to trouble us still. Yeah, absolutely. Well, okay, so that's good to hear on one hand that, you know, the the kind of the hospital situation on the kind of coal face is not experiencing something yet, which is beginning to kind of cause alarm and panic. Because obviously, you know, my first thought was when I tested positive for the first time, you know, a week ago, since obviously I've never tested positive because I was a March 2020 early adopter. Um, <laughs> I thought, oh, OK, well, I wonder if this is if this is because, you know, the last time I had any protection put into my arm was was December. Yeah. Um, and if that's now making me more, more vulnerable. Um, but it's an interesting one to debate, isn't it? Does the vaccine, does the booster protect us for very long? What are your thoughts on that? My understanding of the literature is that any vaccine booster, whichever brand it may be, apparently the antibody protection or the coverage doesn't last more than two to three months at best. Um, and there's now some studies or some suggestions, again, signals coming that in healthy people who otherwise don't have any medical problems, the benefit from the vaccine uh, is probably not much greater than the risks that they are because of vaccine-induced complications or side effects or other issues. So I think the jury is out now in terms of what booster doses in terms of protection are. I think with particular reference to long COVID, I am not aware of any study that actually says that a booster or a vaccination is preventing long COVID from happening. Mm. So one of the things that I know has been creeping up in numbers, you know, whilst the booster and the vaccination campaign was rolling out was obviously people who were showing up there as a result of um, the vaccination itself. So having never had any complication, any COVID test, anything that's kind of given them a positive diagnosis uh, with a COVID infection and um, the, the similarities between a COVID infection and a post-boosted negative reaction are, are they're very close. So is that something that the medical world are allowing themselves to talk about now? Because a lot of people were very much dismissed that no, 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 that's probably not, that's not, that's not happening for you. You, you must have had COVID. Are you seeing more people in your clinic now who are probably linking it back to the date that they got that jab? Absolutely. I, I think uh, at least one to two a month, patients a month that I see in the clinic are mm. very clear that their problem and their presentation of long COVID-like features started after the vaccine, mm. either the first or the second or the booster dose. And I am quite open to actually saying this is probably a vaccine-induced side effect. Um, it's very difficult for me to say whether this vaccine is a problem or is that a risk with any viral vaccine? Because right. there are instances of side effects happening with flu vaccines, measles vaccines, other vaccines in the past as well. And we must be pragmatic and say, those vaccines were being given in the thousands or maybe in the small millions and you had 
you know, single digit or double digit side effects. Yeah. When you're giving a vaccine in the millions and billions, yeah. are you likely to see more numbers of side effects there? That is what I'm trying to think of it. But I try to definitely, and I know that a lot of long COVID clinicians that I'm speaking to are aware and are accepting that sometimes you can have long COVID-like presentations after the vaccine itself. It's unfortunate mm -hmm. that if some patients are getting a different experience, um, I can only sort of feel sorry for them there, but I know I, that a lot of clinicians do agree with the fact that the vaccines themselves can cause a similar phenomenon. I think it's really important to hear you say that because I know quite a lot of people have been dismissed, um, you know, when they've taken their case to to perhaps talk about it with a with a doctor or even, you know, any kind of <laughs> medical environment. And so I think, you know, for it to be something that people acknowledge and say, we're really sorry that this is happening to you and it very much could be linked. I think that's such a, an important sort of statement for a patient to hear uh, because you know, when you live in that body and that experience happens and then two days later, three days later, this thing out of the blue comes, you've got a pretty clear idea that probably that's what's gone on for you. And so it's really important just to be validated because at least then you can get on with recovery. I think if someone denies that this is happening for you, that you're sort of stuck in a holding pattern. So it's really important that, that you've just said that, Deepak. I think it's going to help some people kind of move on with some of their kind of frustration, which actually can really hold people back in getting better from this kind of thing. So thank you. Absolutely. Okay, we're gonna move on. We're gonna move on to a question about inflammation. So is there any change in the way that we test for and look for long COVID and the, the inflammatory responses that are basically kind of the essence of what long COVID is. Because it's clear that inflammation is a major driver of symptoms, and yet regular blood tests show nothing in many cases, which can lead to people being told that there's nothing wrong with them. Now, I know my own experience was um, back in 2020. I went into A&E around month, the end of month three. I'd never been that unwell in my life, and yet I had this you know, good standard set of tests that told me, well, everything looks great, Susie. <laughs> and I was really quite surprised because uh, there was a lot of stuff going on with my body that I'd never had go on before. And, you know, I completely understand why people can find it really confronting to be told, you look fine on paper. <laughs> so how are people testing now? Has it changed? Has there been any movement forward on that? And what do we do with people who are given this kind of technically all clear? How do you work with them? Excellent question, uh, really. And it's something that I've been giving a thought to as well and probably started or applying for funding for a research project in, in, my, in my neck of the woods, in my hospital there. Um, the reality is that there are about 90 long COVID clinics. So I'm going to come from the perspective of, of a long COVID clinic based within the NHS. And we are still very much bound by and abide by the nice guidelines that have come out. It is a living guideline, which means it is being updated as new evidence comes through. But as far as testing is concerned at the primary care level before a patient gets referred to a long COVID service, there is no new testing for inflammation that has been added to the initial panel that has been suggested. There is a double answer to this is, in most places, it is the GP who's doing the testing because still, I think 60 to 70% of the long COVID clinics in the country are predominantly aimed at rehabilitation. So yeah. the initial testing is done by the GP, and then the long COVID services usually facilitate the rehabilitation. And they are then, if patients do have a problem that's probably like rheumatology or neurology, they are then referred into those existing pathways that are already there in a secondary care hospital for the speciality. There, the rheumatologist might do some added immune testing or some extra testing. But by and large, if your initial testing is normal, the GPs have no further instructions from NICE 
to do any other testing, then it is left very much to the individual GP and their interest. Now, in the face of that, when patients come to see me in the clinic or my colleagues and my team members, we are very much of the belief, and at least I fully subscribe to the evidence that there is a low-grade neuroinflammation going on. There is an inflammation going on within the nerve circuits in the immune system. And so my answer and my explanation to a lot of the patients is I completely agree with them that it is still feeling inflamed, but mm -hmm. that it is at a low-grade level that really can't be evidenced in a blood test or on a scan. And right now, our aim should be to say, what can we do to reduce that inflammation? Yeah. And in that sense, I think the best evidence or at least a good quality evidence that is not going to be harmful and can give benefit are all the lifestyle measures that we talk about, the work that you do. And I think that would be the way I steer the conversation and take them through a more hopeful frame rather than, as you said, leaving them feeling that what's wrong. Right. Yeah. I think it's really good to hear you say that um, because actually, you know, I think when someone presents with a set of symptoms and let's say, you know, we look at the average person before they've gone through this process and become quite unwell, they've probably been living a very busy life and they've been doing life the way that they want to do it. And so when they show up, somewhere and say actually this has completely changed my life I can't do my life now and just because those test results are saying all clear that doesn't mean that they're not unwell that means that there's just another route out which might be more complicated or even impossible to explain yeah but I think making sure that GPs really know about the concept of dysautonomia um, and you know the basics of MCAS will really begin to help people just at least have something that they can take away and explore. Uh, yeah. Because I, you know, most people don't make up chronic illness. I mean, obviously there'll be a percentage of people for whom there's some psychological impact that's going on there too. Maybe there's trauma, et cetera, et cetera. But for the average person, they're not making this up. This isn't a lifestyle choice. Yeah. And there's definitely a genuine need for someone to, to say, look, I can see that you're not well. Let's see what we can do to kind of find something that will help just calm and soothe. And this, as you said, that lifestyle medicine choice is there. And I think one of the key aspects is around kind of peer support to let people know yeah. they're not alone, to help them to work out how can I join something where other people are like me and they're doing stuff to help themselves get better because it's incredibly empowering as I've seen and I know that you've seen when people are sharing their stories and, you know, the grief of the loss of their identity together with other people, it sort of inspires them. It can inspire them to move forwards together. So, so I, you know, my takeaway from this, hopefully for, you know, those people listening is just because someone's test results are clear, it doesn't mean that there's nothing wrong because, you know, nine out of 10 times, it really does mean that there's just something else that's just more difficult to explain that's going on. Yeah, and it might just be that there's lifestyle stuff that they can do to help themselves get better. Yeah. But um, I think this this leads us to actually, can I just, I'm just keeping an eye on the time for us because <laughs> we can talk. Yeah, I, know no, that. No, I agree. I'm going to jump us straight into antihistamines because we, as a long COVID kind of cohort, we've been talking about antihistamines for a good while now okay so taking antihistamines h1 and h2 blockers are part of any long haulers toolkit and most see an improvement from taking them very quickly so for me within 12 hours and i took them accidentally because they were going to help with sleep and then oh my goodness they helped with about 50 other things as well um why might some gps still be reluctant to prescribe this kind of medicine when others actually base their protocol for recovery around them. So I'm just really curious, tell us more about the antihistamine. So I think the, the, the basis for the theory, so first of all, from my perspective, I also subscribe and believe that there is a role for histamine in this whole process of yeah. long COVID persistence and maintenance. The data and the science is very uh, logical and likely to be causing or contributing to the problem. 
The second step to think about is actually whether this is a full-blown mast cell activation or whether this is a histamine intolerance, that still needs to be fully clarified. What I'm pleased to hear about is actually your endorsement or your view of what your group members are saying, because that's I think that is the challenge mainstream medicine has right now is there is so much anecdotal evidence and there is so much more coming out there replicating it in a scientific manner has been the logical challenge. So studies still looking at this role of antihistamines haven't taken off as yet, or mm -hmm. at least I'm not aware that there have been big trials or big studies starting to look at this in more detail. So I think if something like that were to come, it would change uh, the way primary care is looking at these treatments. Now, having said that, in my area, again, within my clinic there, we do have a lot of GP colleagues and I've spoken to a few of them and I myself prescribe and suggest antihistamines much more liberally than I was doing six months ago. So that is a learning that has come through that we are giving or suggesting that as an option more often these days. And they are definitely very economically priced drugs and they are... Thanks. They have been around for a long time. So even mm. GPs are familiar with them. Yeah. I think the only place where you're going to get GPs still hesitant is that is that if there is a group of GPs who really want to see evidence for doing that, that has been the gap. There has not been that evidence. And then they get a little hesitant about some of the more newer ones like nizatidine, which are a bit more expensive. Mm. So yeah. I guess that may be the rationale I would suggest that mm -hmm. they may be being more hesitant. But in my area, a lot of GPs are quite happy as long as the long COVID clinic has made the suggestion to consider it a four to six week trial. Then I say, right. you know, if it doesn't work, stop it. They are happy to do. I haven't had any pushback from my colleagues in primary care as yet. Yeah. Oh, well, good. Um, I'm I'm really pleased to hear that because they've been a really important part of our discussion for for quite a long time and and I quite often ask when I have my my large group chat every week and maybe I get sort of 70 80 people in I quite often ask you know who's taking antihistamines and you know we get about 95 percent of people waving their hand and then there'll be you know two or three going I don't know about antihistamines <laughs> okay and then I ask people to kind of, you know, respond according to what they're helping them with. And it will be an amazing array. So from shortness of breath to the insomnia, to the skin allergies, obviously, but to all sorts of things, people are really sort of, you know, attributing the changes and the benefits down to the antihistamine, because that might be the only thing that they're taking that's a medication. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot to be gained, I think, definitely, if people are willing to kind of experiment a little bit and as you say if it doesn't make any difference they just stop taking it that's really easy there's no side effects there's no withdrawal it's nice no nice simple to kind of to play around with Agreed. i'm going to do one more question uh okay it might be a bit big <laughs> let's see how we go Go on. let's get a time Come in on, yes. let's do it <laughs> so it's really relevant right now you know i'm a 50 year old woman like many of the women in our long covid kind of cohort particularly in the uk here uh People are being given HRT now uh, or being recommended to seek HRT as part of the uh, sort of solution, perhaps, to, to see if it makes any difference to symptoms because the symptoms set for menopause, perimenopause and long COVID are so similar. And it's quite difficult to know which comes first, is it the chicken or the egg with this one? Um, I'm just curious, you know, what are you seeing in your clinic? Is this something that's discussed there or is this a GP place? Where does this get talked about? So uh, I think uh, four months ago, even three months ago, if you had asked me, I would have been very non-committal and probably not sure what to say. Um, however, I came across an article probably by Lewis Newson and a couple of other colleagues from yeah. the end of last year, where this link between the similarities between long COVID and perimenopause had been made more aware. 
uh, and I've been looking and reading and sort of deep diving the literature since then. So now I probably would say that, yes, that is a very real differential diagnosis at a biological level. If we are saying that the virus is causing a immune system hyperactivity and low grade inflammation in many circuits of the brain in many right. hubs and zones of the brain, it may very well be causing a such an inflammatory state in the pituitary and in the hypothalamus, which is where the sex hormone control is being happening. So if there is a alteration in how the controlling mechanism for the female sex hormones is happening there, then you can have all these menopausal features mm -hmm. starting to come because of a hormone imbalance or dysregulation at that level or even a hormone deficiency at that level. So I am these days for the last two months in some patients, in fact, many patients, I talk to them about the possibility that this is a differential diagnosis. I have been starting to test a few of them myself to get a bit of confidence, but where possible, I'm talking to a couple of GPs and maybe saying, would you test and see what and how to prescribe or talk about HRT because that's something I'm still not comfortable with in a long COVID sure. service. So I don't do that part of the talking or the prescribing, yeah. but I've been asking GPs to say, look, is this something you'd consider investigating and maybe giving a trial? And for mm -hmm. some patients who already have done their homework, who come and say, can this be menopause? I'm concerned. I want to try it. Yeah. I'm actually suggesting, do you want to go and see probably? So I think the person I'm naming is actually Dr. Louise Newson, whose Absolutely. work I've come across. Yeah. And I kind of suggest check out her team and maybe there's somebody on her team who'd be able to see them privately if required and give them the support or prescription and monitoring if required. Well, that's really good to hear you talking about her because she's an absolute pioneer uh, around that whole kind of menopause, perimenopause, and now adding her long COVID kind of research into the mix. She's definitely the go-to place for most of us in the kind of, you know, in the, the long COVID world. Um, and one of the things that I would say, and in, and in some ways this makes it simpler, at the Newson Clinic, they now just say, look, don't don't try and do a, a test. Don't do the blood tests anymore. There's no point. Just work with symptoms. And if you can, offer treatment according to the symptoms that are presenting. And if that changes something, then great. Because actually a, a hormone profile we, will change dramatically from day to day. So actually your blood test might reveal something on one day that you then try to work out the perfect concoction for. But by, you know, seven days time has passed, something else will be going on there. So they now very much don't advocate testing. They just work on talking, listening, symptom checking, diagnostic, and then a treatment plan if appropriate. Um, but one of the things that I will say that from my own experience was, you know, my, my long COVID journey disrupted my cycle quite extensively for around six months. And then it all completely settled back down to normal again. And, you know, now I'm back having a very regular monthly cycle and I'm not taking any HRT. Um, so the body will also reset if it's going to, you know, it, it has every opportunity to do that if you just give it all of the right kind of environment. So, again, that yeah. leads us back to the, the lifestyle medicine, just making sure the diet is really good, the sleep is prioritized, you feel supported, you know, you, you know that you, you kind of understand a bit about what's going on so the fear doesn't drive all of the, the sort of response going on. Because I think that's for a lot of people, the fear of what's happening in their bodies can cause a huge amount of extra cortisol, which then impacts everything else that's going on. So yeah, yeah great. Yeah. Well, it's really yeah. good to hear you talking about uh, HRT as well in your clinic. And as you say, you know, it's something that you're not 100% comfortable with having the, the, the kind of direct contact for, but it's great that there's, you know, a, a, an opportunity for you to refer out as well. So I think fantastic. there are resources available and certainly things yeah. to be done. I'm just caught, I mean, aware of the fact as as is discussed, HRT is also still a scarce commodity right, right. now. Uh, and, you yeah. know, uh, and, and in some ways, yes, if you think about it like a drug, if we are saying, oh, yes, you've got pain, um, you've got fatigue, maybe you'd like to consider a 
a nerve pain medication. So now my choice is, well, you've got pain, you've got other symptoms, possibly menopause, HRT to consider with. And I think at a very pragmatic level, the question that the GP or me will have to ask is, would a patient prefer to be on HRT for a foreseeable future? How expensive or pragmatic or useful and sustainable is that versus yeah. another drug? On one hand, you've got supposedly very minimal side effects with HRT, whereas mm -hmm. drugs like pregabalin have problems. But yeah. on the other hand, something is going to cost and everything that costs, the evidence will be looked at. And that's where I think it's probably the responsibility will be lying that if you're going to say, let's move everyone to HRT without testing, let's do everything there anyway, give them a trial for three months, then we have to ask how the costs are going to be borne and what would we do if it doesn't work? When do we stop if it doesn't work or works? Right, yeah. Well, I think that's something that Louise Newson and her clinic are really looking at. So I think, you know, if this is something that, that people are interested in, she has an amazing website, which is really, really worth exploring. Um, yeah. and because, you know, they're constantly putting out new data. So definitely worth keeping up to speed with, because I definitely see for some women, it makes a massive difference. Absolutely. And for others, for others, it either makes them worse or there's no difference at all. So you know, it's not, it's not the golden ticket. Uh, it's not the silver bullet, you know, whatever precious metal we want to attribute to this. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I think even, even in that kind of menopause arrangement, like you spoke about uh, Susie, ultimately what we need to make sure and what we tell in our clinics as well is that focus on sort of the six pillars of uh, the lifestyle medicine, uh, which is there, but more importantly, making sure that the basics are there, good relationships, right. ensuring that they're eating well, sleeping well, and making sure that their you know, physical activity is carefully paced and prioritized and planned. I think those are still fundamentals of every long COVID clinic that I'm hearing. Absolutely, absolutely. Right, Deepak, we're gonna stop because we do want to open up questions to the rest of the group that will be watching us by the time we're yeah. playing this live. So I'm gonna press stop right now and we will pick up the conversation. Fantastic, thank you, thank you very much. And delighted to say that there have been quite a lot of questions, so we'll not hang around because uh, time's running on. But uh, just to let everyone know, Deepak and Susie have agreed to stay on, stay on a little bit longer to answer questions. So really interesting one here, uh, just opening up to both Susie and Deepak. Um, has long COVID been linked in any way to ethnicity or socioeconomic status? Uh can I take a start on that, Susie? Please. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, uh, the data is suggestive that patients who are initially, when people got COVID, there's definitely the data to say that people from ethnic minorities, probably because they were key workers, maybe there's a higher representation among key workers, were more affected. Uh, there was also the suggestion that these uh, ethnic minority people also lived in crowded housing or maybe had comorbidities. So all of that suggested that these people would be at a high risk of long COVID. I have data from my clinic where we looked at the first 100 people that came through and we had 19%. So one out of every five long COVID patient was from uh, ethnic minority or an underserved population. Uh, we are yet to have more robust data there, but uh, in our service, we've got some funding now to actually work with an organization called Community United in Berkshire. And what we're doing is we're trying to get the message out to more underserved populations to actually make them aware. Because what we realized from our data was that a lot of people still getting referred to the long COVID clinics were actually coming from the sort of affluent areas. So the people who knew what they wanted, what problems they had, they were reaching out and pushing their GPs to refer to a long COVID service, but the underserved population weren't necessarily coming that far forward. There are a variety of complicated reasons for this, but I think over the next six to eight months, I'd be able to give a little bit more concrete data. Susie, do you find, how do you find it in your Facebook group? Do you have any comment from that side? Well, I think again, 
<clears throat> like you found, you know, the people that make their way to an, an online support platform, like one that you find on Facebook or a self-selecting group in the same way that the people that are attending my program, whilst I've had over 5,000 people come through the program now, I would still say it was majority white middle class because they're online doing research and they're happy to take part in things that they can kind of, you know, identify with. Um, so I would say, yes, it's really difficult to get a, a good enough data set on that one at this point. I think that's going to be a fascinating one for the years to come, isn't it? To have a really good uh, in-depth look at that. Um, another question then, um, uh, again, for both. Uh, um, do uh, How do the under 16s suffer long COVID? Is it exactly the same symptoms as, as adults or is there a differential between the two groups? So we, in, in our area here, Oxford is the central hub. So for those of the listeners who are listening there, uh, the central NHS suggested that there should be 15 hubs for pediatric patients uh, who would support patients up to the age of 16, probably 18. And then the, all these hubs would then have various spokes. So in my area here, Oxfordshire, the Oxford Clinic is the pediatric hub and uh, we are the spoke per se. It's been really surprising. Oxford have told us and shared data that they have been getting a lot of patients, younger patients being referred to the Oxford hub as it were. But from Berkshire, uh, we just did a data uh, search of the last year. We've had only six patients being referred less than 16 years into our Berkshire clinic. And a couple of them we've sent off to Oxford. We are, my physiotherapist and myself, we are comfortable looking after uh, children as well in terms of supporting them with strategies there. But the predominant symptom has been fatigue. We've not touched wood. We've not had any patients with that uh, multi-system inflammatory component that we've been reading about that can affect some children. And those children maybe have been finding their way to Evelina or specialist children's centers in the UK. But my data, and I'm probably maybe not qualified enough to speak to that right now, that our patients, pediatric ones that have come along, uh, COVID, only one of them has come who has had the same constellation of symptoms like adults, but otherwise all the other children we have had, fatigue has been their only residual symptom around six, seven months when we've been seeing them post COVID. And Susie, do you, do you have any under 16s in your group? No, I don't have, oh, well actually we, we have put on recently a brand new class, which is Rest Repair Recover for Kids. Um, and we've had maybe three or four uh, young people sign up and attend that and they've all been around the age of, of sort of nine to 12 and I would say the and you know it's a tiny little group because I think it's quite a difficult sell to a young person the idea of attending an online class um, but the ones who've shown up have really really loved the fact that it's a session for them with other kids that really that really are in the same position and they all really want to relax because they're actually quite upset about being ill and I think that you know the, the family dynamic will become very stressful as well so if the parent sees that the child's doing something that makes them relax the parent can relax so the child is is kind of co-regulating with the parent so the actual act of doing this you know just a guided relaxation from you know I have a lovely yoga a children's yoga therapist who leads the session I think it's really really helpful but we are definitely I've definitely had contact with one of the leads of the kids long COVID parents group and there's quite a lot of teenagers with POTS um, which seems to be one of the sort of the main symptoms along with, as Deepak was saying fatigue um, and, and kids because they're not talking about it with as much kind of ease as an adult would be they might just say my tummy hurts I don't feel very well um, and so it's quite difficult to kind of extrapolate what's going on for some young people because they just feel so awful but they don't know how to describe it. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so yeah, it's very sad, very sad. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, good question here. Uh, they're all good questions, obviously. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe you have direct experience of this, Susie, I don't know, but um, if you're suffering from long COVID, um, do further COVID infections increase the severity of the symptoms and the longevity of the condition? Well, <laughs> I'm hoping not. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm just coming to the end of round two and it has kicked me in the pants a bit, but nothing like it did uh, first time around. But what I will say, it, uh, you know, obviously now I'm, I'm the main host of quite a large Facebook group, which is full of people who are having reinfection. Um, you know, I see some people on their third and their fourth, you know, which I just think is incredibly unlucky. Um, and for some people, it does tend to kick off a whole kind of storm of symptoms again. But for most people, they say that they're coming through these, these kind of further reinfections much more quickly with a little bit more of a kind of a simpler experience of it. So it does tend to be a little bit easier. Um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one to kind of keep an eye on. But on the whole, I would say it's not making people as unwell as they were. I definitely see one or two who pop up every now and again and say, oh my God, my second infection killed me. You know, like I am totally wiped by this one. Um, but on the whole, I would say most people are finding that they're managing them. But also, you know, we just know a lot more about what to do when we get infected. So we have to stop work instantly. You have to kind of, you know, take your diet back to a really clean one. You have to rest, 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 rest. And that might have not been what happened when you were first ill. You might have pushed through with work. You might have been trying to homeschool your kids. You might have been trying to exercise and, you know, do a thousand things as many of us were during the kind of initial lockdown phase. So none of which will have helped the body deal with the virus. So I think people are approaching it now with more education and more wisdom. So fingers crossed. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that that answer is a big no on my part. <laughs> does, does that strike a chord with your kind of experience as well, Deepak? Yes, I agree with Susie there. I've had... It's been a mixed bag of patients coming to the clinic, some of whom have felt considerably worse after reinfection. And for others, they are definitely able to say that it's nowhere as serious or severe or uh, impactful as the first one. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, uh, a vaccine related question now. Um, should people with long COVID continue to take the vaccination and uh, boosters offered? I'm going to hand that one to you, Deepak. <laughs> we had a big chat about this the other day. I know, yeah, it's, it's difficult, Fraser. I think I'd be guided by, to a certain extent, by the guidelines that come out from the Joint Committee for Vaccination. I'm hoping that they would make a proper case for the data for further boosters to be given when appropriate comes along. I think being an NHS uh, employee myself, uh, I have I have less say in actually if a decision is made on behalf of the NHS, I don't think I, I would really be able to have much say in that. But the data right now from looking and reading the US literature uh, is that in healthy people, there is a lot of debate going on on what is the role of a booster in otherwise healthy populations because any antibody or any protection given is only a couple of months and certainly it doesn't seem to be preventing a variant from you know a person catching an infection a mild one so there is a lot of conversation happening to say is it really required for a healthy person for someone who is classed as ex clinically vulnerable or having comorbidities then I think the case becomes a bit more clearer to say that if boosters are offered, then they probably are going to be better off taking it. Mm. Great. Okay, thank you. A couple of antihistamine questions uh, here, uh, and I'll, I'll put them both together. Um, you talked at length both about antihistamines uh, with long COVID. Is there any evidence that uh, antihistamines are beneficial during the initial COVID infection? And also, um, are, is there any evidence at all to suggest that a low histamine diet and natural histamine blockers can be as effective as prescription drugs? So uh, I'll probably take the initial side there. I am aware of no study or rather I'm not aware of any study that's looking at antihistamine use in acute COVID. So that probably is the first response to there. The second one is the concept of a low histamine diet, maybe Susie will talk to that from her experience within the group. But my understanding after speaking to the dietitian colleagues in my area and also online is that the low histamine diet is quite a restrictive diet. Uh, it, it does put a lot of 
uh, cramping up your style in terms of what you can eat and cannot eat. And I think if somebody is going to consider doing a low histamine diet, then I would recommend that they speak to a nutritionist or someone who can guide them in the journey. Most long COVID clinics I know do not have a dietitian in there who is able to recommend and support. So you're looking at going private. Again, that applies to the same. I'm not aware of any natural histamine blockers that would be effective. Susie, over to you. Would you have anything to speak to that? Well, I guess one of the one of the things that uh, happens for us on social media and the way that people share information is obviously there are some patients who go and speak to uh, private consultants for whom this is their speciality field. So Dr. Tina Piers is a specialist in MCAS and uh, Dr. Paul Glynn is someone as well that a lot of people are going to. Um, and a lot of people are coming back and experimenting with the low histamine diet and they are taking it in conjunction with antihistamines. Um, most people are not doing one or the other. Um, and I would say that, you know, for those for whom it works, that really restricted diet really, really can be a life-changing diet, you know, and for the good. And it's miserable as hell, right? It's, it's not a great diet to be on. <laughs> but, you know, for those people for whom it, it, it offers benefit, it is an absolute gift. So um, uh, people will go off and try it. You know, I think pretty much everyone that I know that's that's aware that they've got some form of MCAS going on for them and the antihistamines are re really making a big difference for them when they take them, they will also try the diet. Um, and, you know, and, and many of them will stick on it for quite a long period of time. So there's constant discussion around who's got an interesting recipe to share. <laughs> Who's got any good low histamine food recipes? My God, we're running out. So, you know, it's, a, it's often quite fun to kind of, you know, get those on an MCAS diet into conversation because the despair can be quite entertaining. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, another vaccine question. Are you, are, you two, are you two okay to carry on for a few minutes more? Yeah, no worries. Great, thank, thank you. So another vaccine question then. So... Um, have vaccines reduced the incidence of long COVID? So I, I guess, have there been any studies uh, between uh, people with COVID after vaccinations and people who've caught COVID that have not been vaccinated at all, who then go on to progress to long COVID? Is there any study out there that can answer that question? Not really. I think, in fact, that's where I, you know, I think we should be proud of the NHS for actually being able to set up such a number of clinics in, in England and in the world, really. No other country has been able to do this at scale like the way England has done in terms of putting together 90 long COVID clinics that are centrally coordinated because it allows us to pick up the research. It allows us to pick up the numbers. We are having to submit fortnightly data on how many patients are getting referred. The reason I say all of this, uh, Fraser, is that in answer to the question, I have been, uh, when we started the clinic by the middle of last year, June, July, we were getting 150 patients a month being referred to our clinic. It tailed off during the end of last year to about 50 to 60, 70. And then my thought was that when the Omicron variant was going on at the beginning of this year, and by that time, most of the population had been double vaccinated and many people had been boosted as well. Our thought was if the Omicron variant is that infectious and long COVID does not depend upon the severity of the infection, I thought three months after the Omicron variant, there should be a spike in the referrals coming to long COVID clinics. And from April, May onwards, that hunch has proven right. Our numbers have climbed to about 80 to 90 referrals a month. And that's where it's been for the last three months. So we don't have studies to prove that, but from looking at the trends of what's being referred to the clinics across the Southeast and possibly across UK, I think the numbers haven't gone down at all. So I'd probably say that to say that vaccination hasn't made a difference to the long COVID rates. Mm, it's interesting. I, I would agree. I'm definitely seeing um, <clears throat> an uptick right now in people coming into the program and trying their, their first free week. Um, way more way more than you know i would say six months ago so i'm afraid this is not uh the vaccine is not the solution to this longer problem definitely yeah that's, that's interesting 
Mm. Okay, I'm going to end on this last question, uh, and I'm not entirely sure, Susie, whether this was a tongue-in-cheek question or not. Um, <laughs> probably Try not, actually. Probably <laughs> not, actually. Um, but how did you manage, when you were setting up your programmes uh, and working with the NHS, how did you manage to put through all of the red tape uh, and get approval to work within the NHS? <clears throat> I've never had approval to work within the NHS. Um, I just started doing what I was doing. So, you know, I saw an opportunity. Um, I needed it myself. I set it up. I'm someone that's worked for themselves for their entire life. So I've never had anyone saying, you can't do that. So I just went, oh, this is what I need to do. I'll do it. Um, and my work started getting a reputation reputation which then attracted the attention of doctors because people that were coming through my program were going out and talking about it with doctors consultants and so people started to then refer back into me doctors that had said oh well I can't offer you anything but I've heard about this woman Susie Bolt <laughs> and she's running a program and she has these interviews which are really educational so actually we've just developed this wonderful kind of symbiotic relationship that is neither formal nor informal and yet I do get <laughs> NHS trusts now uh, sending me their staff so I have quite a few trusts that have started to pay for their own long COVID staff members to come through the program which is great and Oxford NHS Trust were one of the first to do that because as uh, Emma there said that she'd been stalking me for quite some time uh, and thought that everything that we were doing is fantastic so she said I have some really sick staff members I want to put your way um, so yes it's um, it's an unofficial official relationship <laughs> Think of it like that's, that. That's absolutely, that, that's absolutely fantastic. And it just shows, you know, if you build it, they will come. Uh, right, and it's, it's, right. it, it's, it's the same as lifestyle medicine. Is where it's a groundswell from the bottom up right. uh, and not the top down, which is absolutely fantastic. Well, I think we'll call it an end there because I think you, most of the other questions that you probably answered in your Q&A. So I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank everybody for attending this evening. It's been a great presentation. Thanks so much to Susie and Deepak for staying on a little bit longer to answer questions and for their tremendous presentations. So on behalf of BSLM, thank you, very much appreciated. Thank you, Fraser, for having us. Have a good evening, guys. Thank you very for doing well. this. Thanks everyone. Cheers. Thanks, Bye. Guys. Bye. Bye.